Every day, you see the signs happening all across the world. Jesus said, when we see these things, we can know the end is near. Through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, discover the truth about what your future holds. Join speaker Linwood Spangler as he uncovers the truth with PowerPoints of Prophecy. The topic of our message this evening is the psychics versus the prophets. Researchers say that all of us dream dreams usually several times a night. Sometimes those dreams are good and sometimes they're not. Perhaps you've awakened right in the middle of a particular wonderful dream and are disappointed that you can't go back to sleep and finish it. Has that happened to you? Or maybe you're awake in a cold sweat, breathing hard and, and so relieved to discover that that really scary dream that you just had was not reality. True story tonight, President Lincoln once had a dream and he remembered it, but he wished he hadn't. He shared it with his close friend, Ward Hill Lamont, who wrote it down in Lincoln's own words, and this is what he said. About 10 days ago, the president recalled, I retired very late. I soon began to dream a dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There, the silence was broken by pitiful sobbing. But the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight. But the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. I was puzzled and alarmed. I kept on until I arrived in the East Room. There I was met with a sickening surprise. Because before me was a platform for a coffin of someone of state, and around it were soldiers acting like guards, and there was a throng of people gazing mournfully upon the corpse whose face was covered. So he asked the question, who's dead in the White House? The answer was the president. He was killed by an assassin. A few days later, on April 14, 1865, a much-loved president, Abraham Lincoln, was killed by John Wilkes Booth. His body was taken to lie in the state in the East Room in the White House. You see, friends, it was a very remarkable dream. Sometimes dreams come true. One of the most remarkable dreams we want to look at tonight comes from Daniel chapter 2. Turn there in your Bibles, if you will. The biblical book of Daniel is chapter 2 that we want to look at this evening. Now, friends, remember this. There's two books in the Bible that are like sister books. Daniel and Revelation. Jesus said to read and understand what book? Come on. How many were here last night? Of course, all of you were. Jesus said to read and understand what book? The book of Daniel. Why? Because it's for the time of the end. And so tonight, what God has in store for us is the next building block of truth that we might be ready to go into the book of Revelation very soon. Because you see, some people try to be New Testament Christians, just base their faith upon the Gospels and the New Testament, and then they get confused when they hit the book of Revelation, and they're told by Sunday school teachers alike saying, don't even study for that. It, it, it's after the church is raptured out. The problem with understanding the book of Revelation is that if we don't have a knowledge of Daniel, Revelation doesn't make sense. Because there's a principle in the Bible that's practiced many times. It's called repeat and enlarge. It's called what? Just like we do our children. We teach them to say, dad, dad. The first word, of course. Dad, dad, and you keep saying it over and over and over and over until finally they say what? Mom, mom. <laughs> Repetition enlightens the heart and the soul. 
So God teaches us a very basic principle tonight. You're in the second night of this seminar. We have many nights to go yet. The foundational principle of all prophecy will be found in what chapter? Daniel chapter 2. Last night we talked about what topic? It's like a rumor again. <laughs> Say the message together. Last night's topic was? All right. Now, why do I do that to you? Someone said to me last night, Lynn, why do you ask us questions? You make me feel like I, I don't know what, and I do know it. It's because our mind can get into the mode of hitting the red button when we're here. Those of you who were here last night, you understand what I mean. I am not here to entertain you. If your mailman entertains you, he's not going to get his work done. I'm... That must be an interesting mailman back there in the back. <laughs> I am just a mailman. I'm just delivering the mail from God. Friends, I have to be very careful that your mind stays in a learning mode. Because in a situation such as this, you can mark it down. If you're not careful, your mind can get diverted into what you have to do when you get home tonight, what you're doing tomorrow. And unless I continually ask for a response to make sure you're along with me, I don't want you to come here and just warm a pew. God has a higher calling for your life. And I believe the information that we're going to discover tonight will be very helpful for you as we continue. We're looking at the books of Daniel, and we'll eventually look at Revelation in a few nights. But again, Daniel chapter 2, page 879, if you haven't found it yet. We're looking at the psychics versus the prophets. Now, all around us, there are many counterfeits, meaning there has to be a what? True or an authentic. So if there's a gift of prophecy that is an authentic gift, we will see it because Jesus said to study this book, Daniel was the authentic prophet. With that in mind, a little historical background of the time period of which we're looking at. The kingdom that is ruling, as we discovered last night, was Babylon. Babylon had taken over Israel. One of its men, and the holy men of Israel, was Daniel. He went on to rise to prominence in the Babylonian Empire. He passed the test in chapter 1 because he was faithful to God. And now Nebuchadnezzar is going to come to a period in his life where he needs God's individual. What's the three applications of Scripture? Number one. No PowerPoint to help you tonight. Remember the last night, the, the literal application for the time period of which it's written. Are you with me? What's the second application? Anyone? This worldwide application, spiritual worldwide for all of God's people. And I hope you get the third one or I'm going to have to step down two steps and start over again. What's the third application? Personal application. What is the personal application to this story tonight? I know many of you have studied this chapter several times in your life. And now we're going to do it again tonight. Oh boy, I hope Lynn gets on into the Antichrist topic soon, some people tell me. Friends, I promise you, tonight's message has an application for your life right now. Right now. Daniel had been taken out of his ideal. Daniel had been uprooted from his security of everything that he had known. He was ripped out of his home, lost his loved ones, lost everyone that he could associate as a connection of life, taken into a foreign land transplanted into a different area of which he could not choose, given different things to eat and drink, and tested like he didn't want to be tested. But because Daniel loved God, he passed the test, and the Bible says in chapter 1, he was ten times better than all the other wise men. The authentic versus the counterfeit. Daniel did not wake up in his first morning of life and say, yippee, I'm going to be an example to all the world. Daniel was just living his life in love with his Redeemer. Are you hearing me tonight? You may not feel that your life is so meaningful in 2008 in Fort Worth, but friends, I promise you, God knows the end of your story. And he has brought you into existence he had you in mind in the beginning of time when Adam was created for what time period 
Now, Acts 17, 26 says he created all flesh in one blood, Adam. So when he created Adam, he created you. And he not only knew what time period you would be born, but where you would live. And he says, you are called, you are chosen. You are a special generation. Someone where you live needs what God has given you. The message in Daniel chapter 2 was the mightiest superpower ruler that ever existed in that time and every time before it needed Daniel. What does your neighborhood need tonight? More importantly, what does your family need tonight? You know the gift you've been given. It may have been sitting on the shelf for all these years. You know the gift you've been given. But Lynn, I've tried to offer my gift to others, but it just doesn't seem to be important. You know the gift you've been given. God has given you your life for a purpose. You are not just a statistic on planet Earth or the Social Security Department. You are here for just as important reason as anyone else in this room. Two people believe that. We'll work with the rest of you. God has put us here for a reason. He has put a calling on your life that you will know that reason why you are here before you put, finish this seminar. Daniel knew that he loved God. And he knew that his future did not lie in what good he did, but he loved the one that could give him good thoughts and feelings. So the king was King Nebuchadnezzar, and he went to bed one night, ate too much pizza? No. He had a dream of which God had given him. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans. For what purpose? To show the king the dream. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream wherewith my spirit... Stop. Hold it right there. Throughout this seminar, we're going to come across words throughout the seminar that I challenge you to underline and write in your little notebook that you have with you special words to do word studies on because in a coming night, this word spirit is going to be highlighted. There's a lot of controversy over this word. But in this seminar, every night, you have come because you want to learn the truth. Amen? And so we're going to reveal the authentic purpose of this word that you might be able to help others understand it. All right, so his spirit. This particular word here has a different meaning in various different texts, but in this particular application, it means his thoughts and feelings. He says, my spirit was troubled to know the dream. So he woke up from the dream and he goes, wow, it was an awesome dream, but I just can't remember the details. I've got to remember it. He felt impressed that it was something unique about that dream. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 4, then spake the Chaldeans to the king of Seir, O oh, king, live forever. Tell thy servants a dream, and we'll show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. In other words, you've been told. What's the matter with you? The thing is gone from me. If you'll not make known unto me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut to pieces. Your houses shall be made a dunghill. Now God caused the king to forget his dream. Why? To reveal the contrast between the authentic and the counterfeit tonight for us. And to reveal who is the true God. Verse 6, but if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again, verse 7, and said, let the king tell us servants a dream. They're so bold that they tell him, come on, king, you've got to tell us. 
We'll show the interpretation thereof. And the king answered and said, I know of certainty that you should just gain of time. Notice this. They ask for more time, and the king says, no, you just want more time, hoping that I will forget. And notice the contrast. The counterfeit, who think they're the authentic, by the way, they're convinced what they're doing is right. But Nebuchadnezzar says, I know that all you want this time for is to push me off. No more time. If you can't tell me the dream, and not only the dream, the interpretation, you're out of here. And not only out of here, you will be executed. This was a life or death circumstance. The king was fed up with paying wise men who were not wise. Can you relate? You take your car to the mechanic, and he thinks it's this problem, and you give him $195, and you drive it out the driveway, and it's a different problem. Oh, well, that needed to be fixed, too. It's frustrating when you pay for something you don't get. Hello? What frustrates me is when you buy something, they know exactly how long it'll last. They give you a one-year warranty, and one year and one month, it's gone. <laughs> the king knew his time was up on these wise men. But yet, we're going to see night by night, God says he didn't learn his lesson because he keeps calling for the wise men every time he gets in trouble. Is it that way at your work? Is it that way at school? If you're a student here tonight and, and you go to school and you're learning as much as you can and you try to be responsive in the class and, and, and the teacher calls for an answer and you give it to them and then you notice the teacher's spending time with someone else. And you go, well, that's okay. And then maybe you, you do a perfect assignment the teacher doesn't notice. The king knew that he had been paying these wise men to do a certain task. And now their time has come, and he's mad. Verse 12, for this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon, which included who? Daniel, and who else? Did I hear pagan names out there? What are their names? Starts with an H. Hananiah, M, Mishael, A, Azariah. Give me their Christian names. We'll see in chapter 5, those Christian names will come up again. Verse 15, and he answered and said to Arioch, all right, so what happened? The, the wise men caretaker, if I may, started going out and gathering up the wise men. The king said to destroy them if they didn't come up with the answer. So they go to Daniel's house, and he says, what's going on? Why is the king so hasty? Verse 15, then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. In verse 16, Daniel went in. Whoa, hold on. No wise men walked in before the king without an invitation, unless you were a friend. A friend? How could Daniel be his friend? He lost all personal security. He was uprooted out of his life. He was put through a test. He, 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 they even tried to brainwash him with food and wine and all kinds of things. And now he's the friend of the king where he can walk in and say, uh, excuse me, king, what's going on? King, um, I'll get you the answer, but I need a little more time. Now, Daniel was already briefed that the other wise men had asked for more time. Who did Daniel think he was that he could go in and ask them for the same thing? It wasn't who he thought he was. He knew who he knew. When you are doing the right thing for the right reason, don't be shy about it. Sometimes people do the right thing for the wrong reason. But my friends, when God inspires you to do that which is right, I don't care whether it's at your job, at your workplace, at, at, at your home, when you're doing the right thing for the right reason, don't be shy about it. Stand up for holy boldness, and God will give you the desires of your heart. 
Daniel, yes, he was uprooted. Yes, he was in a strange land. Yes, he was tested over and over. And now it is his life on the line. Do you think he's hollering and screaming and ranting and raving? It's not fair. I wasn't even called in. How come he's going to kill me? What was taking place to Daniel's life was not just, was not right. It wasn't setting wrongs right. He was dying because some other wise men could not answer the question. But Daniel was tested to this point the maximum amount. And do you think he broke down and got excited? No. He just said, I'm going to see the king. If I'm going to die, what, you know, what's wrong with walking in before the king? Friends, if we are living to save our life, we will never serve God. But when you're doing the right thing for the right reason, you will always serve God throughout eternity. It begins in the mind. Daniel was not afraid of humanity. The only one he feared, and that's godly fear, honor, respect, and obey was the God above. And so Daniel went in and desired the king that he would give him more time, that he would show the king the interpretation. What did Daniel do when he got more time? He went back and held a prayer meeting. He knew what to do when he was in trouble. He knew that where his source of life came from. Did you ever get a letter in the mail that IRS is wanting to check out your tax report for five years ago? Nobody? Wow, that's awesome. Yes, there you go. And when you get that letter, what do you do? You go, oh, man. Instantly, the flesh goes, what in the world did I do wrong? You automatically, if you think from the human perspective, you all of a sudden think, oh, man, what if I get caught? I don't have any money for fines. Even though you know you didn't do anything wrong, you start worrying. Did Daniel worry? No, he just says, come on, guys, let's get together. God's going to give us something. He knew in advance that's why he went before the king. If he knew in advance that he wasn't able to help the king, do you think he would have wandered into the king's quarters? No. He knew in advance this was his moment of time. This was his opportunity. Friends, when you come to the end of your road as far as humanity is considered, watch out. That's when you're about ready to test out the streets of gold. They're transparent, so I'm told. The gold is transparent in heaven. You won't be able to see him. Can you imagine when you come to the end of humanity, when you can't seem to go any further, your limits have reached the end. And now it's time to walk on that transparent gold. Your relationship with Jesus. Where is he taking you? That's what Daniel did. He walked into the king. The king gave him more time. He goes back and holds a prayer meeting, comes back to the king in verse 19 and says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed himself and his three other men. Is there anybody out there? 400 people let me get away with something like that. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Friends, when we get answers to prayer, where do we, where do we send our blessings? Oh, I'm so good. God answers my prayers. You want me to pray for you? God answers my prayers. Be careful. If the devil can't get you away from prayer, he'll use it against you. Verse 26. The king answered and said to, Belshazzar, to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar. We'll forgive him this time. Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Dan Daniel answered in the presence of the king. In other words, he didn't go around beating the bush. He didn't tell everybody in the neighborhood that, look, I'm going to meet the king. I've got the answer to his dream. I've got it. You guys couldn't get it. <laughs> Not Daniel. Daniel went immediately before the king and said the secret, but now he's going to be a little human. The secret which a king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show the king? Who were these men? 
the magicians. Again, there's a present day application. Watch this, friends. The magicians were those that used the sleight of hand, any kind of trickery or magic they could to get the king's attention to convince the king that they were better than the average person there. And if you could do that, you were set. You had a, you had a beautiful palace that the king had set up for you. You were royalty. Magicians. How many people go to Vegas today Spend fifty to hundred dollars to watch somebody make a motorcycle disappear. God's going to make a world disappear pretty soon. And it's going to be free. And then the astrologers, they were ones that would go out and stare at the stars, hum, and then tell you something you didn't know. And they were so good at it that they got a beautiful palace and royal robes, and they were the wise men. And then we see the, the sorcerers. They were unique individuals, too. The sorcerers, well, they were ones that really would get into a trance and tell you all that you wanted to know because they claimed to communicate with your dead loved ones. Are you hearing me tonight? It, it's the same today. I mean, primetime television used to produce a program. I don't know whether it's still on or not. It was called Crossing Over. And people would come from all over the United States, and they'd, they'd interview them before they were up on that show, and they'd say, why are you here? Oh, we watched him, and we thought it was interesting. We just want to see what he, We don't believe in that stuff. And then they'd interview him afterwards. And they were, <gasps> he told me all these things that I had forgotten. Listen, friends, God isn't the only one that knows what happened in your past. The devil and all of his angels know a lot more about you than you know about yourself. It's one thing to tell you about the past. It's another thing to tell you about the future and be 100% correct. God says over and over and over and over in the chapters of Daniel, which he tells us to read and understand, he continually contrasts the major focal point of all these chapters that seem to be children's story is wake up planet earth in 2008 because there's a small authentic that's straight and narrow, but there's a lot of counterfeits out there and you're getting entertained by the counterfeits. Jesus says don't even go there if they say they are of Christ and they're not. And then the Chaldeans, now, this is probably the majority of us today. You know, we have that computer at home. The Chaldeans were, they were the IBM spectacles, if I may. They had their computers all over their rooms. They were ready to tell the king whatever he wanted based upon the, well, not computers. There were scrolls back then, but they had everything that you could have, all the records of the past. And they knew exactly what volume to find, what king did what, and, and, and they could constantly go back and say, well, this king did this in this situation. It's very similar to this one. So, king, we would recommend this. Friends, your computers at home will not give you what the Holy Spirit wants to give you. I don't care where the web can take you. Without the Holy Spirit, it's just a lot of information. It becomes a red button. So here these men were. They had just gone before, and now Daniel's standing there before the mighty superpower leader, and he's so bold, he's not being obnoxious, he's not being brash, he's just saying, King, what happened to the other wise men? He had to bring the king into reality that, king, you have some people in amongst your midst that you thought were authentic, but realistically, they don't know where their source of truth comes from. They think they're doing your will, but really, they're not able to lead you into the place that you want to go. And he then, Daniel, begins focusing on his God in heaven. How do I know that? Because the next chapter we will see tomorrow night, Nebuchadnezzar knows what God looks like. How did he learn that? Because of Daniel. Daniel brought him so close to God that he could recognize him when he saw him. But yet Nebuchadnezzar kept his distance so that he was still in control. It takes a real man to let God control your life. Verse 28, 
He continues, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the what, friends? In the latter days, thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. Here he goes. He continues to go on down through and he says, now as I read the next verse in verse 31 and on, we're going to have an artist's conception up there of what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Here we go. Verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image whose brightness and excellence stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold, his chest and arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. He continues, thou sawest till the stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broke to pieces together and became like the chaff of summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away that no face place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And he continues, verse 36, this is the dream we, not Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We, God and Daniel and the men, will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art the king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Verse 38. Wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven that hath given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Read it together with me. Thou art the head of gold. Isn't it amazing how the Bible is the best interpreter of itself and yet you can turn on many television stations today with prophecy lectures and they say the head of gold represents something else. The Bible says the head of gold represented Babylon. Babylon ruled for a limited amount of time from 539 to 331 BC. Now if you're not a history buff, hang in there with me on these dates. I didn't like history either until I learned that it points us to certain events that will come in the very near future. Because we, when we learn how long Babylon ruled and the succinct powers after that, we will learn when the Antichrist comes on the scene. Because it's all tied in. So Babylon rules for a limited amount of time, and then we go on. We can tell actually from Daniel chapter 5, which we'll see in a coming night on the fifth night, that Daniel saw this take place when Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians, as it says there in verse 28. 150 years before Babylon fell, Isaiah tells us the story of how it would fall. Notice, Isaiah said in Isaiah 44, verse 27, Thus saith to the deep, Be dry, I will dry up thy rivers. And thus saith of who? Cyrus. He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, watch this, Thou shalt be built. We'll go there in another night. Prophecy lectures are still quoting who's going to tear down the temple in Jerusalem and build it back up again. We need to understand the first application of which we will tonight. Thou shalt be built, and the temple and the foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holded, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins to king and open before him to what, friends? To leave gates, we'll learn what that's all about in a moment, and the gates shall not be shut. So seriously, friends, Isaiah told God's people 150 years before it take, took place that Cyrus would be the one to conquer Babylon, and he would enter into Babylon because of two open what? Gates. As you understand history, if you go to the British Museum, there's a lot of artifacts there in regard to what happened to Babylon. Babylon had the river Euphrates that flowed right through the center of it. In the river Euphrates, they had special gates of which they would shut and only open certain times. Well, we know what happened to Babylon when it fell that night. They got drunk, thought they were so invincible that they got drunk. The men on the wall left the gates open and Cyrus diverted the river Euphrates and they marched right in. We didn't know exactly until we found the Cyrus Cylinder, which had three different languages that help us to interpret the cuneiform tablets regarding Babylon, but God continues to reveal artifacts from archaeologists that we can understand the Bible. He wants everyone to have enough evidence before he blows the trumpet that everyone can choose either God or our way. 
And so tonight's prophecy seminar is not just another seminar. It is a seminar for you to have an opportunity to know the difference between right and wrong from the Bible and the Bible only. So the Medes and Persians conquered Babylon. We understand that. Now, what kingdom came on the scene in 331 B.C.? Anyone in here? The Grecian Empire. That's exactly right. The Grecian Empire was a very mighty, swift power. The leader, of course, we know as Alexander the Great. Daniel 2, verse 39 says, Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the earth. Alexander the Great conquered the then known world very quickly. In fact, history writes this. I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his what? Birth and his actions. Isn't it amazing how God can take people that don't claim to be Christians and yet they will fulfill God's will? Sometimes I wonder, does God use people that are not proclaiming to be Christians because he can't get Christians to do what he wants them to do? Not you folks, of course, because God called you here and you obeyed tonight. This is the beginning of the rest of your life. He says, as, as often as you practice my will, he will bless you. He will bless you. He longs to bless his people. And so he uses Alexander the Great and goes in and, and conquers the Medes and Persians. Why? Because they began afflicting God's people, much like the Egyptians did. And so Greece ruled then from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. Now we're coming down from the thighs of brass to the what? Legs of iron. That's right. The legs of iron is very unique. The legs of iron is spoken of clearly. Let me go back, if I may, to the Grecian Empire. If you look back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, it talks about the ram and the rough goat. And it says that Grecia conquered the Medes and Persians. All right, so let's go back now to the legs of iron. In verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdues all things, as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So something is unique. You'll notice God is spending more and more time through the eyes of Daniel as he's now talking to King Nebuchadnezzar in what time period? The later days. Daniel didn't spend much time on the time of Babylon. He says, King, you're the head of gold, but listen, there's other empires coming after you. And he uses more and more verses to explain the future events. Why? Because God is speaking to us tonight. And you'll notice all through the book of Daniel and Revelation, when he comes down to our time period of earth's history, he uses 50% of all prophetic books to talk about our time period. Why? Because he knows we need it. He knows exactly what information we will need to get through to the end. And the only way we will understand that information is if we can come to places like this and study the word and understand them. History reveals a lot about Rome. I don't know whether you've ever been to Rome, but it's one of the most remarkable cities because it has so much history there as to what happened to God's church. Through the ages, they would bring people into the Colosseum and you'd sit there in the stands if you were a Roman citizen and they had, they had numbers painted on the backs of the Christians and they would tie them up to post and then you bet which person would live the longest. For entertainment, the red button. People would pay big money to come into the Colosseum. Then they'd let the lions loose and tear them to shreds. The legs of iron. That's what humanity does. Well, Rome ruled from 168 BC down to the middle of the fourth century AD. Now, we come down through those legs of iron, and it says the image of gold, Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, says the image of gold and of silver and brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. History using Bible terminology there. Drop down to verse 42 now. If you're looking in your Bible, verse 42 and as the toes and feet were part of iron and part of clay, so also the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. All right. Now let's go down into the feet of iron and clay. How many toes do you have tonight? 
That's 30% of you. The rest of you need to count them when you go home this evening. <laughs> Ten toes. When Rome was not conquered but divided, much like Russia, it was divided the first ten years after the divisions took place into ten different divisions. Now, if you get down 20 years, additional divisions took place. But the interesting thing is these ten divisions become very unique in light of prophecy tonight. The ten divisions, you can see them on the screen. Alamanni representing the Germans. Burgundians representing the Swiss. Franks, French, Lombards, Italian, Saxons, English, Suevi, Portuguese, Visigoths, Spanish. And there's three very unique tribes or divisions of Rome of which if you take them down to your local library or now that you have internet in your home, you take and type in their names on the search engine, you will discover a lot about the Antichrist power when we get up to that in the future. These tribes are very unique. They were destroyed for a very specific reason. And they'll be very enlightening for you as you go on. Verse 43. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the what? Seed of men, but they shall not what? Remember that, friends. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. What is this telling us tonight? Babylon was overthrown by the Medes and Persians. The Medes and Persians were overthrown by... Greece. Greece was overthrown by Rome, and Rome was what? Divided. Divided into the ten tribes of Western Europe. The Bible is telling us that Western Europe will never come back together again as one empire. That's different than what many prophecy lectures are saying. You say, but Lynn, what about the euro currency? It seems like they're all bonding together. The Bible says they shall not cleave one to another. If we doubt that phrase, then... What do we believe? We can't pick and choose verses, friends. How many have ever traveled through Europe, Western Europe? Let me see your hands. Put your hands up higher. Lights are high. I can hardly see. There you go. All right. You will know if you have traveled through Western Europe that when you cross those borders, especially into France, they stop the train and they will check you out even every piece of luggage. I was coming back from Africa, 1989. Coming back from Tanzania. And... I was by myself. My wife was home on the college campus working. I was, remember, I, well, I didn't tell you this story. But anyway, it's a long story. I went to college when I was 34 years old after a 17-year detour. We'll tell you more about that another time. But I was in Africa for four weeks, and I went from there up through Europe to do some more things up there, and then finally came home to Virginia seven weeks after I was gone. But I came back from Africa after doing a seminar in, in Tanzania, and my bags were full of all kind of carvings and artifacts from Tanzania. I had canes that if you would pull on them correctly, made out of black ebony, there was a long three-foot sword in there. I had nice little wood handles that if you pulled them apart, was a nice dagger inside of it. I thought they were beautiful. They had copper rings around them. Everything was handcrafted. So I bought up all these things, and they were very inexpensive. The cane was like 5 to $7. So I just gave all my suits away to the ministers down there that had holes in their elbows and holes in their toes and gave all that away and thought, I'm bringing back as much artifacts of Africa as I can get. Every day I'd get the taxi to run me out to this tin roof where the carvers were there carving with their hands and their feet. You give them a postcard, they'd carve it into a plaque. Excellent workmanship. Anyway, I'm crossing the border now in Western Europe on the train. I was in sleeping at night by myself in a, in a sleeper car that had six bunks in it. And all of a sudden, about two in the morning, it seems, the car come to a screeching halt. And I heard a lot of people speaking in a foreign tongue, and I thought, you know, when you wake up and you hear noises like that, that gives you a nightmare, believe me. I could hear the car doors coming open and shutting, and all of a sudden I woke up. The lights were on, and I was no longer alone. I was the only man in a car with five other women. Now, to get the picture, they're speaking in a different language. Five other woman, women in the car I was in, you talk about a nightmare. I woke up and I thought, is this a dream? Wake up, Lynn. What in the world? Where is my wife? What This other language? You know, it was like a, a bad dream. And so all of a sudden, the door come open on our car, and this Frenchman come in, 
all uniformed up with a gun and everything, and he starts demanding thing of these other French women in the car. I'm laying back down thinking, what is going on? Where am I? Where did these women come from? I'm a married minister. <laughs> what am I doing here? And so the guard instructed each one of these girls to get their suitcases down. And he went through every single garment. And I'm thinking, oh no, am I ever in trouble? I've got those swords and knives in my suitcases. And not just one, the suitcases were full. And so he finally got through all the women. It must have taken 15, 20 minutes. And then he hollered. He said something in French. I said, pardon me, I don't understand your language. And he said it again. I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand your language. He said, get down, get down. So I climbed down. Here I was in my pajamas. The other women are just staring at me like, huh. I said, I'm married, I'm a minister. <laughs> he said, get your suitcases down. I said, well, you know, I don't understand what you're saying. He says, get them down. I said, I don't understand. In French, that's what he was telling me. I said, I don't understand. Ah, oh, go back up to bed. So I climbed back up in bed. I go, Lord, help me wake up out of this dream pretty soon. I don't like this dream. <laughs> but my point was, Western Europe, friends, will never bond together. That was an example. The Frenchmen do not trust their neighbors. How are they ever going to unite to one empire and fight as one empire as some people say they will? The Bible says they shall not cleave one to them never. Now, yes, the leaders would marry, intermarry. The Bible says that would take place. But, friends, that's still not making one empire again. The Bible says clearly what will happen. They shall not cleave one to another. Friends, many rulers have tried to conquer this prophecy. Charlemagne tried it, Charles V, Louis XIV, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, and Hitler all tried it, and clearly, friends, they could not do it. Napoleon said clearly that God Almighty has been too much for me because he knew the prophecy, and yet he continued to try to conquer it. Verse 44, notice. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Amen. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all kingdoms, and it shall stand for how long? Forever, friends. Remember that. God says this next kingdom that comes on the scene is not a temporary kingdom. This next kingdom will be the result of God finally taking control, doing the work of the righteous judge, which is going to set wrongs right. Do you hear me tonight? What's going on in your life tonight that is not fair? Only you know. God says, don't worry about the present. Let me take care of the present. I've taken care of the past for you. Let me take care of the present and the future. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, the word says. And lean not unto thine own understanding, but in how much? All thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So before we go any further in this seminar, let's read the blessed hope together. Let's read it. Let not your heart be... Continue. Where is God? Where does he want you to be? In heaven. That's the words of Christ who is not trying to sell you DVDs. That's the words of Christ that has given you life to this point. And that's the words of Christ that longs to spend eternity with you. He says, where I am, you will be also. So what's keeping the world from understanding that? Their own choices. Their own choices. And the red button. He says, I want you with me. What else do we need? I mean, think about it, friends. If the mayor of Fort Worth said, I would like you to come and be in my quarters, would you respond? Do you know something about the mayor that I don't? 
Would you respond? If you knew in your heart he was calling you because he knew you had a relationship with God and he wanted godly people around him, would you respond? Yes. If the governor of the state of Texas called you and said, listen, I've heard good things about you. I need you in my immediate staff. Would you respond? Friends, the God of all universes who speaks worlds into existence says, I've, gone to God, I've left to go prepare a place for you. Will you respond? He says, I've created a mansion for you that I will never turn into a dunghill, as Nebuchadnezzar said he would. Daniel saw a magnificent vision. Daniel saw what was going to take place, and he looked at Nebuchadnezzar. Can you imagine being Nebuchadnezzar? He looked into Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, and he says, King, I know your dream. This is the dream, and this is the interpretation. Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar? He now looked at a wise man, and he looked at him with different understanding that he ever did before. Daniel knew that what he was seeing was much bigger than his time period. What are we seeing when we look at Christ? Are we just looking at what's going to happen to us today? Are we just begging for God to fix our car because we can't afford to fix it? Or are we living our life because we have a vision for eternity? Young people, why are you in school? Because it's a tradition of America to get enough knowledge to be able to get a job? Are we in school because that's the end thing you do when you're that age? Are you in school because your parents are putting you there? Or are you in school because you want your mind to be focused on Christ and to allow the Holy Spirit to use school to prepare you for what God has called you to do. The men in this congregation, why are you working in the job you work? Because it was the only job you could get? Or do you know in your heart God is going to use the talents God has taught you for some unique task that he has created you for? The women in this congregation, why are you who you are? Many women do, do not discover who, why God has created them until they lose their husband. And they realize, who am I? What am I here for? And unfortunately, it happens in the latter years when your children are gone and you look around and say, why am I here? Why does life exist? Daniel could have felt the same way. I mean, I've been in Babylon now years. I've passed the test and nothing's happening. When the king has problems, he calls the other wise men. No, Daniel knew in his heart, God will call me when he needs me. Until that time, I love him, I trust him, I will be faithful by his power. I will be consistently predictable in God's principles, even if the majority of the world is going a different direction. God is going to focus more and more on Daniel's life the more we go along. The Bible says in Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and he shall reign for how long? Forever. We serve a God that is mighty. The last events of Daniel, yes, we'll go into more details as we continue, friends, but the next thing Daniel sees on the picture after the broken up portions of Rome, he sees Jesus coming as the rock cut out without hands. The nations of Europe will come to an end. God will set up his kingdom. That's the major overview of history, of prophecy, pardon me. The kingdom will last that God sets up. It will last forever. And he's preparing that kingdom in your heart and mind. Jesus will be the anointed king of kings and lord of lords. He's longing for that moment. Are you? He comes to earth to reign. To reign, to understand that he is going to lead us from that time on. Nebuchadnezzar settles into the reality that regardless how good he thinks he is, he's not as good as the God Daniel has. And he sees something in Daniel that he longs for.
Daniel 2, 47, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the what? Revealer of secrets. Do you long to know things for the future? God says he wants to reveal to it, friends. The giant image seen by Nebuchadnezzar in his dream six centuries before the birth of Christ, God unveiled the mysteries of the coming empires. The kingdoms represented by gold, silver, and brass, and iron have all passed into history, friends. And now the next glorious event, according to Daniel 2, that we can look for, and it's coming very soon, is the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus. The journey is almost over. The blood-stained cross of Calvary it is only a short time until all these things are fulfilled because of what Jesus did on Calvary. He had you in mind. He had me in mind. And he has his kingdom of his beloved in mind. The thief on the cross watched Jesus perform the things that he did. And finally his day of judgment came. But his time wasn't over. Why? Because he saw something in Jesus. He saw something in Jesus. And then he said to Jesus, read it with me, Lord, remember me. Let's say it again. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How many of us have that desire tonight? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Is it Jesus' desire to hear his people say that? Of course it is. He longs. Don't you long for your children to call you up and say, Mom, don't forget me. I love you. Dad, don't forget me. I love you. How could I forget you? Jesus says, I created you. When I created Adam, I had your life in mind. When I died on the cross, I died for you personally. When they jammed the crown of thorns down on my head, I thought about you living with me in eternity. When they drove the nails through the hands that formed you, I thought about you. When I hung on the cross naked in shame, that's okay, Father, forgive them. I'm hanging here for the world of 2008 that they might have what I once had. Jesus loves you tonight. Do you believe it? Amen. He has your future in mind. He is calling the world. He doesn't force. He calls the world to hear him and to respond. Jesus is a living Savior. He says, come, ye blessed of my Father. And what? I don't know too many people that inherit things that don't respond, except to Jesus. I'm so thankful that Fort Worth has this remnant of Bible-believing Christians that love Jesus enough to respond when he calls them. God bless you all as I close with a song.